The Music is Life podcast has our own merch now over on tpublic.com. Click the link below in the video description. Looking for some new threads? We got t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, crew neck sweatshirts, tank tops, baseball tees, and also clothes for kids and onesies for your little infant metalheads. Don't want clothes but love the Java? We got you covered with coffee mugs and travel mugs. Need protection for your electronics? We've also got phone and laptop cases. We've got everything you're looking for at the tpublic.com Music is Life podcast store. Use my link below for fast service. Thanks for your support. TerraNut is proud to offer you a natural nut bar chock full of healthy fats, minerals, and protein that meet your demands. Go to their website, www.terranut.com. You can order from them directly and they will ship it to you. Use my coupon code LUMAVS and you will get a 25% discount on your first order. TerraNut Superfood Snacks, www.terranut.com. Don't forget to use coupon code LUMAVS at checkout. Fuel your life. We are ready and waiting for you now. If it's a fight that you dare see, we've acquired our strength through pain. No more are we pathetic game. We, you are the reason why we claim that we've all become this way. And I regret the prison that I created for. <laughs> that band is was such a big part of your formative years in your 20s because of you know your relationship with mr steve clark i will admit the first that i even heard of the name lorelei shellist was the best episode of behind the music that i've ever seen on vh1 Oh, and oh, I saw God. you, and I was just like, blowing steam. And like, I went when when I when I when I saw you, I was just like, that was Steve Clark's fiance. He's got good taste. And um, <laughs> all of a sudden, it's like I heard you talk of him in this in in this beautiful way. And you have to understand, for me as a kid growing up, when I wanted to learn guitar, my <laughs> my th- my three heroes were Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes. And Steve Clark. Oh my God! And so, they're all and they're all and they all died young. Yeah, mm. they're, my, oh, they're all gone. Damn it! I know. But uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know but, why? Because they gave so much in one lifetime. They didn't need to live a whole one to make sure they did their part. But, they just gave it all, and they, they were like, they fit it all yeah. in. <laughs> but what I loved about your piece in the behind the music special was the fact that you spoke of him so so differently and so beautifully than everyone else because you two had that connection on that personal level all right i I was i was gonna wait until the end of the interview to say this but i'm gonna flat out say it thank you for loving him the way you did because Mm -hmm. i feel like he had those extra years of life because of you just my opinion thank you that's so so kind-hearted of you to say and that that you felt that way and what, what do you want to say, Denise? And even when you were describing the rough times, it was still described with love. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Thank you. And, you know what I mean? Normally you would, you would, you would hear somebody trash that, you know, their ex or whatever, but it was all came. You can tell your love for him was immense. Well, you know, he, he is, he, and I did, I, I, you know, I, to this day, I still love him like nobody's yeah. business, but he, <laughs> it's everybody's business because it is love. And he was one of the most loving guys. He was a very sweet sensitive man and he asked a lot of questions and uh he was really creative and he was interested in wisdom and things i think if he were here now he'd 
wouldn't mind this conversation that we're talking in a, more, in a spiritual way. He was always looking for the deeper meanings of things, which is what I'm always doing. Like, what's the deeper meaning of this? Why did I go through this? And that's why when you when I talk about him, either in the book or in the interviews, you know, it's really about the learning. And there's so much love in the learning. I learned so much from my experience with Steve. I was telling one of my sort of daughters uh, today because she was she's been going through uh, rehab and I've been supporting mm-hmm. her through it. And she didn't realize how much I knew about this stuff. And she says, how come you know all this stuff? And I was talking to her about Steve and I actually it's her. She's going to be 26. And I gave her the book and she's like, oh, my God, you gave me the book. I've been wanting to <laughs> know if it was okay but she's now in recovery and losing steve was how i found myself wow you know him going through alcoholism and then me going through al-anon and learning what you know my role in it was and why i was the way i was and why I was always trying to fix everything, because that was my distraction, fixing things. Now, I love to be right. productive. Like, I love to get stuff done. That's why I do all those right. projects that you hear what you were talking about on my, you know, my little bio there about how do you do all those things? It, I, I take things on as a project until I do them. And then when I'm done, I move on to the next project. Right. Right. That's, yeah, that it's completely happy. admirable. I mean, I, I think yeah. it's great that you do all that. Unfortunately, we live in a world where it's like we're constantly on our phones 24 seven, even when, when we're in our sleep, it's like nobody stops for a moment just to like say, Hey, you know, let me go help someone today, or let me do something to help someone else to help themselves. You know, it's like, you, you don't really hear about a lot of those things. You know, unfortunately, when you're in a 24 seven, you know, news media world that kind of just focuses on the superficial and, you know, ratings and selling you know, magazines, if they even sell magazines anymore, I just think it's it's just important for people to remember there is a reality outside of your front door and just connect with it and see what you could do to make it better, you know, and, and you do that. And it's, 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 it's wonderful. Oh, gosh, I'm, you're making me feel so good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. But I, I, I have to say that with all this media stuff and people being glued to their phones and Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff, I've slowed it down a lot. And another another thing that happened, and I know you were going to ask me, maybe I'm jumping a, ahead, but I like it's kind of organic during when the COVID thing happened, you know, you <clears> talked <throat> about how you started to do something you, you were going to do your dog uh, your, your, uh, dog dog training? Yeah. training business. Right. And then COVID mm-hmm. happened and then you couldn't visit with anybody or whatever. Same thing happened. I had designed the dream dress. I'd been building it up for like a year ahead or more because it's been a seven year project to try to get these dream dresses out. Right. Perfect uh, segue. Yes. We need to talk about the dream dress. So. Yeah. yeah. And I had only just gotten them and they had the shipment had only just arrived at the end of the year that in uh 2019 right so i was just oh. in january gonna get going to sell these dream dresses and i started to have all these gigs that i had booked that i was going to that were women's conferences self-empowerment conferences things like that and you could have an exhibit table and i would put the dream dress up and i was just starting to get going and then it was locked down Uh, And all of a sudden I had all these dresses and nobody was going anywhere and people were losing their jobs and, you know, people were staying home in their jammies and nobody was like, it hit the fashion industry like nobody's business unless you were Lululemon. And <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm not kidding you. And, yeah. and, and not only that, that was the reality of it, but the other reality of it was, I'm not going to go on Instagram and Facebook and try to sell people something that the last thing they want to know about right now is like my dress. And how dare I go into their world and try to infiltrate that information on them at this point. And Larry, my husband, he's the executive vice president of marketing at Searchlight Pictures. So he spends his whole entire 
every day building these campaigns, you know, these uh, award-winning, Oscar-winning movie campaigns like Jojo Rabbit. He uh, had Jojo Rabbit. He had um, uh, Nomad's Land was another film, uh, 12 Years a Slave, uh, Shape of Water. These are the movies he works on. Oh, wow. He's really, his mind is constantly in like, you know, how do we get people in movie theater seats? How do we get people to this picture? How do we make them Oscar winners and all this stuff? And he, his business was just like all of a sudden that point it's like what do we say and nobody knew what was going to happen next everyone was so scared right during yeah. that, that period that's why I say it was almost like it was almost like 9-11 what happened to us it just wasn't as momentarily impactful but it was impactful right. in so many people's lives like you had plans everyone had plans and all of a sudden the plans were gone right, right? and so yeah. there I was with these dresses and I mean, I'm only now just starting to do some little postings about the dresses because it's a great time of year for those dresses. Uh, they're perfect lightweight, but they also have long sleeves. So you're not too hot. You're not too cold. It's a great time of year for it. The color, the leopard dress is chocolate brown, <laughs> like the leopard print and that sexy slit up the front where, you know, but it's really appropriate. So you don't, you can kind of see through it, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's feminine, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, vulgar in any way. I don't like vulgar fashion. I like, you know, I, I like feminine. I like utilitarian and things like that, but I don't like mm -hmm. over the top. Like I, I don't want to say names, but you know, who I'm talking. About. <laughs> we know. And, so, uh... Uh, yeah. So the dream dress, but with the, the great thing about the dream dress is that it is so easy to wear and it's so comfortable and you can machine wash it. And I've done little videos where I show you how to, you know, you toss it in delicate, you toss it in the dryer for five minutes, you hang it on a hanger and you're good to go. You Perfect. Know, and and yep. you can wear the thing 12 different ways. So if you're going out of town for a weekend, you can do that. You can you can uh, change the, the way that you wear the tie and you don't have to take a lot of stuff. You know? Denise, I think I know what you should mm -hmm. ask Mike for Christmas. Yeah, I know. I was just going to say. <laughs> and they're really comfortable. They're on really comfortable. Uh, the, it's a jersey spandex uh, stretchy fabric, right? So it's jersey nice. spandex. So the the sleeves, the dress, and it fits nice here. And then it's very forgiving on the, on the hips because it's a full skirt, right? Perfect. And it's like so it's like the wrap dress, but it zips right up here, right? And then it's got that chiffon print, the animal print, which is just on the trim, and it's just got that sexy kick pleat in the front. I was wearing yeah. the amethyst one the night Larry and I went out the first time when we got back together, like four years ago, I was wearing the purple one and I we were <laughs> walking to the table and he goes, what a great dress. Wow. And I go, nice. what you like my dress? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, really great. I go, God, thank you. I said, I designed this dress. And he said, you did. And so I did a little twirl and everything. And like, we've mm -hmm. been together ever since. I thought, he's got good taste. <laughs> See, it's the dress. That's what it is. The dress. <laughs> it's the dream <laughs> dress. Yeah. Runaway, runaway. Oh my God, you, know, you go from a reunion to a, a marriage fall in one dress. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> very cool yeah but anyway so i kind of mm -hmm. you know it, it was tough uh, you know but then i just focused on other things the next project was having that wedding on the uss midway but anyway that's another story so what's your next question that's cool yeah it's funny like we, we we bounced around on so much but all of them were pertaining to questions that we were going to ask you so yeah, yeah, you're you're moving the conversation along so well. Thank you. It's like you know, <laughs> I'm just kind of going. All right, well, I'm glad that, to be. I'm that. glad to oblige. <laughs> um, well, remember the prayer that we said at the beginning. It's all happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I guess I need to uh, bring up. I mean, it's not an elephant in the room question, but we we kind of need to say it. And as form as a former employee of MTV, I'd like to apologize. For hysteria, the Def Leppard story, because uh, that was such not a true depiction of the uh, band. I mean, geez, they got so much wrong about that film. <laughs> um, it was like Bohemian Rhapsody in the dirt before those movies came out. 
I have to, we have to ask what is what was your take on it when you saw it and were you Baby, happy with I... Amber Valletta's portrayal of you? Hi, I'm Lorelai. This is Stephen Clark. Hi, Phil Collin. Hi. Def Leppard. Oh yeah, Valerie mentioned that. Oh, forgive me, I'm not much of a heavy metal fan. <laughs> well, um, I'm not that critical. First of all, I. Th- you can be brutally that, um, honest. It's okay. No, 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 no. I, I just, I had an answer. First of all, I don't think that there, there weren't that many of those kind of biopics being made yet at that time. It was one of the early ones, right? So yeah, I think 2001, yeah. probably know as well what they were doing. And I think they got a little too protect, protective. And also, I think that they were budgeted. So they didn't want to pay people to be able to give them um, uh, any extra input right, where they could have. Amber, I was living in New York City at the time, and it was after the 2011 thing, right? I mean, not 9-11 thing, because I was still in, I was back in New York. I'd gone back yes. from Nashville, right? So she got in touch with me and said, you know, who she was and everything, and said, I'm going to be playing you in this movie, and I'd like to meet you, and 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 all of this, and and get down sort of your, your, your way of being and things like that. And I said, sure, you know, and then she came to New York and she was going to some Vogue party with a magazine launch or something like that. So she invited me and I took one of my girlfriends who was also a model and uh, it, yeah, it was, it was after nine 11 and we hung out, she brought me in and she's like, Oh, this is Laurel. I am playing her in this movie and blah, blah, blah. And so yeah. she was really sweet and I really liked her. And she said, I really want to do a good job. I really want to like, make you proud and, and, and all of that. And she said, I'm going to talk to, you know, the production and see if we can spend more time together, but production didn't want to pay for it. Like they didn't want to oh. pay her time that it would take, you know, that she would be putting into researching the character, whatever they do and, and all of that. And they, uh, oh. yeah, for some, whatever reason was, they didn't want her to actually do that with me, but she wanted to. And so she missed out on, you know, it was their bad because it would have helped. Right. Her. It would have helped her. And I think she did the best she could. And I was flattered that they chose a pretty model to play me. So what do I have to complain about? <laughs> well, she was probably the, um, the the breakout actress in the film. But I will say this, though. VH1, you done goofed. <laughs> you should have spent a little bit more on production and make it a little bit more accurate. But whatever. Oh, okay. were you there? Is that your fault, Denise? I knew <laughs> there was someone to blame. I'm no, no, no. <laughs> me. Production. I, 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 I don't realize that they, um, that they paid to, they pay the actresses to do or actors. Well, yeah, everything that the, when, when an actor signs on to do a, a contract for a film of any kind, mm-hmm. there are going to be all these kinds of stipulations and things that the that the company pays for. You know, it's like searchlight pictures, you know, if they go to a film festival and uh, what's her name? Melissa McCarthy shows up because she played in that movie, the one about the writer. What was it called? Oh, such a great movie. Can't think of it. Anyway, they have to pay for everything from the time she starts getting her hair done until she gets home at the end of the day. Right. So really? the same oh, thing okay. with like, so Amber, she's under contract to play an actress, a character in a role. They have everything. They pay for her time. So the time that she would be spending okay. with me, she would do, they would be paying for. And I think, you know, they just didn't have the budget for stuff like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. We I didn't understand. realize that. Yeah. Cost money, all that stuff. If there is anything you wanted to say, say to Steve's fans about how he felt about them, what would you say to them? Wait. Like how, how, how did, how did Steve feel about his fans? Uh, he, you know, he loved the audience. He loved yeah. the energy of the people.
he didn't wasn't old enough to really understand like because they were foreigners in in america and so much of the hysteria was america you know it was all here yeah. it wasn't like in england and stuff so and so we were such a different culture to them and they you know at that age so young it's like you know it's kind of like when the beatles first went to america it's like really you know it's like what is this? <laughs> The Brit Brits at that age, young guys are like, yo, this is something they dreamed about all their life. And so they don't, you know, they and they don't really get it in, in uh, many opportunities where they can actually just now more they do. But back then they didn't uh, have time to just hang with people like you, we're hanging out right now. Oh, you know what okay, I mean? Yeah, they didn't yeah. have the time and or they weren't put in those kinds of situations. The fans were fans and they got to come backstage and do meet and greet. And thank mm -hmm. you very much and say hello for and all that. But you didn't really get to know them and there wasn't time. So he he just mm -hmm. always was so grateful and thankful that they would even want to come back there at all to get his autograph. Aww. Yeah. 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 And also now because with social media, you know exactly how everyone feels about you. They didn't have that back then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So he probably didn't even realize how many people loved him. <laughs> no, I, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. No, I, I think when he would was... go out on stage, it was like, oh, really? You guys are here? Really? It, it must have been. I mean, it had to be uh, surreal yeah. in a way. Yeah. It had to be surreal to be in those white capizios or those black cowboy boots. Right. From that. Oh, the capizios. That was the hard rocker's shoe of choice in the 80s. Oh, man. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, you know, I would just want to get a pair just to say I have a pair. And she's just like, <laughs> God, you were born the wrong decade. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you said that he was kind of very shy. And yeah. but when he's out on stage, was he was he afraid? He had stage, stage fright. He had stage, he had stage fright. fright. Okay, yeah, he had all right. Stage fright, which was, you know, but or maybe that was just an excuse to have a drink. But uh, uh, he um, but then when once he would go out there, you know, like white lightning, it was like a different person. Um, nice. Yeah. That's I remember cool. as a kid on my 11th birthday, my brother, Mike, the one that I lost, he brought home for me on V on VHS cassette in the rounding your face, the concert. And I just remember, I think I wore the tape out because I was watching it every day, every day, every day. I was just <laughs> watching. I was like, that's how a guitar player moves, you know, Aww. and just like, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, I mean, it, it was crazy. I mean, he had his guitar down to his knee. Who does that? Uh, unless it's Jimmy Page, <laughs> you know, and like just well, his, that was his collection <laughs> was just like, I mean, image yeah, wise, that was he was hero. just such a striking, you know, uh, like like a force of nature. You know, it's like yeah. that doesn't come around, you know, and, yeah. you know, I, it's funny. I, 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 there, and then he had those great teeth and then he mm -hmm. had that uh, um, svelte, you know, well, he was just I mean, I, you know, he never lifted a weight in his life. He always <laughs> guitar, guitar cases. That and you designed his jackets, right? You designed his stage. Yeah, work. I did. It was, yeah, it was really fun too. I mean, he, he knew what he wanted and like, you know, know that he was a Jimmy Page fan. Right. So he was of course inspired by Jimmy Page. And so he let me know that. And then while he was on tour, he bought me this uh, sewing machine and I was sitting there in our condo in New York and I would go down and I was modeling down in the garment district at the time and doing shows around there. So all the, uh, you could go down there and buy, you know, all the uh, embellishments and the buttons and the studs and all that stuff in, in the garment district. And there's an area where it's just all about accessories. And uh, so I would go down there and scrounge through this stuff and then show him the stuff. And what do you think of this? I think you should do this. I think that. And I, but I so I wanted to give him that same kind of a thing that he loved about the Jimmy Page look. But I wanted it to be, uh, it, but I was American. I'm American, right? So I, I pulled out these Harley David ban Davidson bandanas with the roses on nice. and things like that. And this was before Guns N' Roses, okay? <laughs> and so and I, I know. take those things and I go, what can I do with this? Like, you know, instead of like a rose, what could I do? And, and so it became like a little more gritty, you know, it's a little more tough because mm -hmm. it was Harley Davidson, but not that tough, you know? <laughs> You know, things like that. That's I would great. That's awesome. These things. And then I would make these jackets and, uh, and, 
And then I would learn eventually, you know, what he could actually wear because he needed to be able to move. And also, I remember the first black jacket that I made with the conch belts. There's two of them. I had to make a second one because the front one, I put these conches on the front and he came he wore it one night and he said, I, Martha, I can't wear this because it's scratching the back of my guitars. And I was like, oh, my God, I didn't do oh, that. So I'd take the conscious yeah. off it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I love I, he calls you like Martha. That. Just to provide context for the listeners and watchers at home, their pet names for each other were their middle names. <laughs> Steve's name was Maynard. And Lorelai's name was Martha. And Martha. that was so cute the way you would read it in like yeah. little British accents. I'm like, oh, it's like an old British couple. Martha. I love it. We used to pretend that was our thing. We used to pretend like we were old people who had been together for 50 years. You know, Aww. Maynard, Maynard, did you have your orange juice this morning? He's like, no, Martha, I don't want any. You know, we would talk to each other in these voices all the time. That's <laughs> so cute. There is um, very sweet. Denise kind of touched on it before, you know, in regards to some of the more negative points in the relationship. And you went into great detail about, you know, how deep his pain was and how you you fought for him. For anyone who might read the book that could possibly have a less fond view of him without understanding because I I as well have had family members that for for lack of a better term they did have their there was bipolarity there and I don't think anyone who hasn't experienced it understands it. But you know if if they're reading the book and they may have like a less fond view of him because of that sickness, is there anything that you'd want to say to them as sort of a hey, you know, slow your roll there. Type yeah, thing. <laughs> well, you know, you already just said it. It was a sickness. It was an illness. And, you know, bipolar, you know, back then people weren't talking about bipolar like people are talking about bipolar today. And there are more and more people who are being diagnosed as bipolar these days. And, uh, you know, I don't know for whatever scientific reason that is. I, I, I think it has to do with processed food, but and a bunch of chemicals that we're eating and inhaling every day that's making people, you know, uh, mentally ill. And but it there are, it's also genetic, and uh, you know, alcoholism is is really a a, a byproduct of self medicating It's like self-medicating. So he was alcoholic, but I think it was because, as I said in the book, he had all these voices in his head and he didn't know how to turn them off. And back in the eighties, no one was really talking about, well, there wasn't, Prozac was just being discovered at that time and, and, and mm -hmm. medications that would help people with depression or anxiety. Now, now there's like hundreds of them. But back then there really wasn't. And so he was not diagnosed as any of that. It was only realized after all the rehabs. And so he was self-medicating by drinking and he would sometimes get out of control. And there were things that happened that were not pretty and he got violent. And, uh, and that was what landed him in rehab. And I think that it's important to know that, um, violence, especially um, abused men towards women and things like that is also passed down. And that's something that's like a learned behavior that a lot of people suffer from in this country and then in this world. And I think it's something else that needs to be talked about as well. Just like we talk about sexual harassment, you know, it's a bipolar a real thing and um, mm -hmm. medications and, um, and then, you know, uh, and, and vi domestic violence is another one that we have to learn from, you know, nobody yeah. wants, nobody wants to be an alcoholic. Nobody wants to be violent. Nobody wants to be anything. Everybody wants to be really good. Everybody is inherently really good, but if they're out of balance mentally, they don't even know. Mm -hmm. They don't even know. Mm -hmm. And Steve just, you know, God, I wish we knew then what we know now. Steve would right. still be here. But then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. But I think it's wonderful, though, that yeah. he still lives fondly in the hearts of Def Leppard fans around the world. And 
again, thank you for keeping his memory alive as 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 lovingly as you do. Seriously, like, you know, I, I love watching your YouTube stuff where it's like you go into your own vault and you show his stuff. And I have to admit, that video... <laughs> Denise, one of the funniest videos I've ever seen is one where Lorelai posted. It's it's her filming, and it's Phil and Steve on their guitars. And Lorelai says, do the vomit thing. And Phil's on his guitar doing, like, retching sounds, and Steve is acting to it. Take two. Take two. And at the end, it does like, like this big <laughs> elephant <laughs> sound. <laughs> and I, I had to step away from my desk at work because I was watching it on my lunch break. I'm like, oh, my God, why did I do that? <laughs> I am so glad I had a camera back then. And Steve gave me that camera. And that's another thing that's changed a lot over the years. I was the only one that had a video camera. And he bought it for me. It was one of those. I mean, it was like one of these. You know, yeah, I went yeah. everywhere with it. We remember. I went everywhere with it. <laughs> it was huge. And uh, and he gave it to me, you know. And so whenever I would pull it out, the guys would all be like, oh, God, get that thing. You know, back then, everyone was like, oh, get that thing out of my face. Oh, Now it's like, hey, right. I'm on Instagram. You know? <laughs> it's a whole <laughs> other right. ball game now. And so they were always <laughs> telling me to go away with the camera. So I didn't get to get as much footage as I would have liked to. But I did get oh. a little bit. And that was funny backstage that was in Colorado. And uh, I think it was in Denver. And um, was that the they, night that the concert was filmed for the for the in the yeah, round? In in the round, round oh, wow. Round. Well, no, it wouldn't have been the night it was filmed because there would have been too much going on for that. No, it was more of a night where they were just hanging out, waiting for the show to start. And we were just messing around. But, he, you know, they spent a lot of time on the road together and there are all those downtimes and they would come up with these games just to like make each other laugh. <laughs> and so that particular one where Phil is playing the guitar, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like. And so Steve did the acting part and Phil did the the score. <laughs> <laughs> the score. <laughs> You know, the, you the know young what? college boy in me appreciated seeing that. I was like, yes, <laughs> brings uh, me back. <laughs> but uh, good stuff. First of all, again, congratulations on finding matrimonial bliss with yeah. Larry. Uh, who knew? I didn't. Right? So. <laughs> it brings me a lot of joy to see that you still have a friendship with Phil Collin and really the members of Def Leppard still. I got to ask. Def Leppard were recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with its current lineup with and with Pete Willis and Steve included. Yeah. How did it make you feel to see the industry finally acknowledge and validate what the fans already knew for years? Oh, gosh, I was so happy for them. So grateful. I, I went. I was there. We were we were the, Larry went with me. And oh, there were all these fans there. Oh, nice. So great. No, I was super proud of them you know the problem you know it, it it was long overdue that's what i think absolutely i think it was Agreed. long yes. overdue only because but not just them getting in the rock and roll hall of fame but getting the respect that they deserve because you know people wrote them off like they were a hair unless you were a deaf leopard fan everyone else just thought oh it's another hair band no they weren't just mm -hmm. you know another hair band they were a fight, excuse me, great band. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, uh, back when everyone was really popular and it was in the eighties and when hysteria just before hysteria came out and everything like that, everyone was getting a lot of like Rolling Stone wouldn't cover Def Leppard. And it would be like, unless you were you too or something like that. And Def Leppard were selling way more records than you two ever did. But it, they weren't political. Do you know what I mean? And so they, yeah. they didn't get that kind of respect in the industry from like magazines like Rolling Stone and, and people like that. And we just always thought, wow, you know, 
okay, I guess you don't get it. And then, you know, basically they just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. I don't think there has been a summer off since before COVID in years. Those guys tour oh, wow. every summer. People are like, oh, mm-hmm. Def Leppard, are, are they still around? Did they make a comeback? They never left. They never left. Yeah. You schmucks. <laughs> I know, they never left. It's like, like, it, like Joe says, and there will be another one. So let's face facts, people here. If alcoholism, car crashes, and cancer couldn't kill us, the 90s had no fucking chance. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, as a fan who could be objective about the material, there's the stuff that I love. There's the stuff that I like. There's the <clears> stuff <throat> that I don't like. But one thing that's never changed is that I'm sure I could speak for Denise and myself. We're still fans to this day. You mm-hmm. know, like I even had mm-hmm. Dangerous from their last album in my top 10 favorite songs list. Granted, nice. it was the only one of the recent albums that you know had a song on there. I mean, everything else was pretty much like, you know, uh, from retroactive okay. and before then, but I mean, Dangerous is such a killer what? song. What I really appreciate about you is, you know, and again, I'm sure Denise agrees with me, you know, is the fact that you preach self love, you preach self worth, and you live it and you share it with others. My, my second to final question, because I want you to plug your stuff at the end of the episode too. Are you at a place in your life right now where you could say that you're happy? Because oh. I think that's the important takeaway for everyone. Okay. Well, first of all, I hate to use the word pre- preach because I don't want to sound like I'm a preacher. Okay. So I apologize. I say I, preach. I'm I, sorry. Yeah. I, I just, I, <laughs> I, I, okay. Because, promoting, promoting self love, promoting self worth there. I think what Teaching. I really try to do is just inspire others to live happy lives or to, you know, to learn how to love themselves and to pay attention to the things that are, you know, the deep cuts below the surface, you know, what really matters, Mm -hmm. the things that really matter. And that's another thing why I, that I think has come around since this whole COVID thing is people are, are, people are starting to wonder, well, what really matters? You know, they've had the time to stop and go, what really matters, you know? And what really matters is, is, is not, how many dresses I sell, not how many uh, guitars someone has or not how, how much I have, but uh, how much I have to give back. And, and in order to do that, you have to live it. So you have to, you know, in order to inspire, what I have to give to others is really inspiration to, to just, you know, go for it. Because that's how I've lived in my life. I mean, that's all I know how to, if I were going to teach something, it would be like, here's how you go for it. You, you go for it. You make up your mind. And then here's, here's all the things, the tasks that you have to do. I mean, I am disciplined like that. I do what's called um, these tracking sheets, right? So we got these at the university. And these tracking sheets keep me uh-huh. on the straight and narrow. It's being accountable. Mm. being accountable for our, myself. And I think that, uh, I don't know, I forgot the question now, but it was something to do with <laughs> self-love. It's about living self-love. You have to do your homework and I do my homework. And because I do my homework, yes, I'm happy. And I'm so much happier than I was before because before I started working on myself and doing all the work and, that, and, and losing Steve was the beginning of that journey. Right. Mm -hmm. So there were 20 years in there where I explored. I was in Al Anon and, you know, I did all these programs and I just, I was constantly like trying to figure it out. And what I realized I need to figure out was myself and then start to know, spend time with myself. And I think that's what we all need to do is uh, uh, pay attention to ourselves. And that's what self love is paying attention to yourself, actually taking time for yourself. And then, you know, what do I want? What do I not want? And so, but it's easy to forget how to do that. It's like forgetting to brush your teeth one day. You have to keep a list and do it every day. Set your intentions, say them out loud, you know, self-affirmations, pray, all of that. Mm-hmm. It, it, you don't just talk about it. You have to do it because that's where the magic, it, the pedal's in the met, metal. 
You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. You have to drive the thing. You have to make it happen. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to learn to love myself. Well, you have to learning to love is actually doing the love for yourself. You know, did I take my vitamins today? All that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. You know? Right. It sounds really silly, That's great. But, it, you know, we forget to do them because we're human beings. And then all of a sudden we're out of balance. We have a cold. Oh, I haven't taken my vitamin C or whatever. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's and the yeah, simplest things that mean the most. Yeah. You're yeah. absolutely right. If people yeah. want to know more about Laura Lichellis, Runway Runaway, and the Dream Dress, and I promise I will post links in the <laughs> bottom of the description, please tell them where they can find you on the interwebs. Yes, I know I said that wrong. Into okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Interweb. That was like what they called it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there's my, uh, the collection website is runway, runaway collection. Dot com and there is where you can find the book there is where you can find the dresses i also have some really cool rock and roll men's shirts in there i've got oh and i've got um some fun hats did you oh, guys cool. see that? i didn't see denise break out the mastercard get us two right now let's go Death leopard, <laughs> Death leopard forever oh cool and they come in navy blue and they come in white and uh, Phil, ha- Phil and Helen, they have, and the baby have one. Everyone else doesn't have one. They're not really hot people. I don't think you- you'll see uh, Joe in one of these, but uh, Probably everyone not, but one. I'll wear one. <laughs> I want to give a shout oh, yeah. out to the um, D- Die Hard Def Leppard fans or the Def Leppard Die Hard fans Facebook. Do you know that group? I do not, but let's plug them. You don't know Karen Fairchild? Who has I, that? I- I cannot say that I do. I um, okay, write that down because you've got to link up with her. Um, they're putting out a book. It's a fan site and there's over 10,000 fans on it. And uh, oh wow, they were, they were all at the rock and roll hall of fame. Well, not all of them, but many of them were. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, you, you, you know, you, you'll get more people to, uh, to hear you. If you, uh, Check in with her and tell her I sent you. So it's it's either Die Hard Def Leppard or Def Leppard Die Hard. But I made these hats for them. So they are Aww. buying them. And yeah, everyone's getting some. It's nice. Yeah. Well, I'm cool. definitely getting one. Denise, Merry Christmas. I'll get you one too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then um, moralishellis.com is the other stuff, more spiritual stuff and things like that. One's fashion and one's uh, more personal. Plus I sell Avon. I'm an Avon. Oh, lady. I'm an Avon <laughs> lady. Yes, I am. On my Laurel Eichelis Facebook page, that's where I show you all the latest Avon things, and I think it works. I mean, I don't look a day over ninety. Oh, you're gorgeous! Stop it. <laughs> you're fabulous, darling. Seriously, flawless, flawless. How? Um, you gotta tell lighting. me what your regimen is. Good lighting. <laughs> Self-care, self-care, <laughs> walk the walk, do, you know, walk the talk, do the work. Yeah. And I really cannot put over how great this book is. And the best thing is if you order it from Lorelai directly, she will sign it for you. Yes. And if you tell me you want me to dedicate it, then I'll dedicate <clears throat> it too. I didn't, I didn't know you didn't uh, give me any instructions when I sent that in. I don't like to impose on people. I'm just grateful for what I get. So <laughs> it just said, and I would have put it in because you never know if somebody's giving it as a present to someone else. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Then you know yeah. what I'll do? I will. Um, as it- this is what I'll do. I'll order another one <laughs> and, and give I'll that put, one I'll away. Put, give that I'll one put, away. I'll put this <laughs> one up for present. charity <clears throat> because okay. oh. because a couple of us at Ratsai Review are d- going to do a Christmas charity thing. We actually have a drum head that's signed by D Snyder that we're going to raise money for Melissa's wish. And this will also give to, uh, well, we'll give the money to the AVG fund. Okay. I'll tell you Aww, what, you guys you. order, order a couple of hats and I'll throw some books in there in the order. That is really cool. Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll, so I'll, awesome. I'll donate the books, but I got to sell the hats. <laughs> <laughs>
thanks to our guest Lorelai Shellis for joining us on tonight's episode of Music Is Life podcast, and thanks to my partner Denise for being on this ride with me. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. It was, no it problem. Was really good. Buy the book. Definitely buy the book. <laughs> run away, run away. Okay. All right. Yes. If you want to learn more about the Music Is Life podcast, check us out at musicislifepodcast dot com. Also, check out our parent network ratsareview dot com. So. We'll be back around for another episode sometime in the not too distant future. Until then, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Bye, everybody, Denise, thanks, <laughs> and remember, everyone, all art is valid. Have a good night. So we gave you our top 10 favorite Def Leppard songs. We gave you Lorelai Shellis. How do you top that? We have Helen Collin joining us on this podcast as well. So this is a Def Leppard loving podcast.